Welcome to the Diversity and Inclusion on Air podcast. <clears throat> podcast is a program of the Association of American Veterinary Medical College's Diversity Matters Initiative. The podcast explores various issues related to diversity and inclusion in the veterinary profession and provides the AAVMC an opportunity to offer ongoing diversity programming to our member institutions as well as all veterinary professionals. My name is Dr. Lisa Greenhill and I am the Senior Director for Institutional Research and Diversity at the AAVMC. So on this special episode of the podcast, we'll be discussing Black Lives Matter and veterinary medicine. As everyone should well know by now, on May 25th, George Floyd was killed during an interaction with law enforcement in Minneapolis, Minnesota. His death came on the heels of the deaths of Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky, who was killed while police were serving a no not warrant uh, at the wrong residence in early March, and Ahmaud Arbery, who was killed while out for a jog by two residents in Glynn County, Georgia in late February. Floyd's death sparked several weeks of protests, they're still going on actually as we record, about the killing of unarmed black men and women and the larger social, political and economic inequities experienced by black and brown folks in the US and around the world. His death also has seemingly triggered an awakening to the reality of systemic racism and how it has impacted communities of color. Now, many folks in the veterinary medical profession have also experienced this awakening based on my personal <laughs> inbox. The last few weeks, there's been a scramble to find data, educational resources, and content on racism and anti-racism efforts. This has both been encouraging and kind of exhausting for many Black veterinary professionals who have been asked to do the laborious task of educating um, something that frankly we've been doing to nearly empty rooms at conferences and symposia for many, 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 many years. So yes, uh, I am calling you out, but I'm also calling you in. Um, this content has been offered, but it's uh, readily available in many places if you just look for it. Now, I know that many of my old and new listeners of the podcast have been reaching out to my guests as well as me for content related to Black Lives Matter and diversity over the last few weeks. This show is really not just about creating content, but really kind of giving space um, for a meaningful discussion rather than a presentation. I would be lying if I didn't acknowledge that I used my own position and my own privilege um, in asking my guests to join me tonight. Racial privilege is not something um, that I get to experience often, and so I'm very hyper-conscious of it. Um, and do my best to acknowledge it when it does happen. So to explore Blackness and Black life mattering in the profession, I'm honored to be joined tonight by four guests. Dr. Kara Williams, one of the founders of the Multicultural Veterinary Medical Association. Dr. Tierra Price, the founder of the Black DVM Network. Dr. Tyra Brown, a board member from the National Association of Black Veterinarians. And Dr. Michael Blackwell, who has had many very, very, very cool jobs across his profession, uh, professional time and beyond, um, but is currently the director of pet health equity at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. So, hello, hi everyone. Hello. hello. Great. So as is our custom uh, on the show, I am going to ask my guests to give us, uh, tell us a little bit about themselves and how they got here to this moment. Kara, why don't we start with you? <clears throat> Hi, thank you so much, Lisa, for having me on the program. Um, can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, so as you stated earlier, I am the founder of the Multicultural Veterinary Medical Association and currently the past president and executive director of the association. Um, I grew up in Chicago. I'm mixed, half black, half white. Um, didn't know any veterinarians growing up. Uh, and decided through watching Animal Planet that working with animals was my uh, career choice. Um, I ended up going to University of Wisconsin vet school. I was the only black person in my class. Uh, I faced a, quite a few microaggressions and some macroaggressions. Um, I would say most people 
think I'm Puerto Rican or um, yeah, Latina, so they don't really know that I'm black at first glance, but um, I still get comments here and there. Um, so getting through my, I don't know, 90, 95% white <laughs> student body experience through Wisconsin was a struggle. And the student um, organization voice really helped me through that. Um, at that time it was called Veterinary Students as One in Culture and Ethnicity. I uh, did go to school in Wisconsin and fell in love with cows there. So I ended up um, pursuing food animal medicine. Uh, and my first job was in Southern Illinois, mixed animal practice. And I was the only person of color as far as the eye could see. So uh, that was difficult for me, uh, feeling isolated out there. Uh, that's when I decided I needed a voice for professional veterinarians. Um, and I started the Facebook group for MCBMA then. Um, and that really helped me being able to network with other um, diverse individuals, uh, people of different races and ethnicities. Um, and now the organization has grown. Mm -hmm. I left mixed animal practice, did small animal pra practice for a while. Uh, and currently I am working with the USDA as a food safety and inspection um, service veterinarian. So basically in slaughterhouses. Uh, and I just accepted a position with the CDC. So I'll be transferring to the CDC at the beginning of July. Congrats. Congrats. Thank you. Tyra, why don't we go to you next? Um, yes, I'm uh, Dr. Tyra Davis Brown. Go by Dr. Davis usually. Um, uh, I'm a small animal practitioner. Um, I own a small animal practice in Hammond, Louisiana. I've been there for 17 years. This, uh, in November, it'll be 17 years. I've been in the same practice since I've um, graduated uh, from veterinary school and began to practice. Um, I bought the practice from my former boss. Um, it'll be 10 years in July, I think. No, it'll be 11 years in July <laughs> um, that I've been a small animal practice owner. Um, I currently serve as the vice president of the NABV, uh, which is um, the National Association for Black Veterinarians, um, established in 2016 and really started to get some traction in um, late 2018, early 19, and we had our um, inaugural conference last year. Um, and um, I can relate to some of the things uh, Carla, Cara said, excuse me. Um, you know, I, I never wanted to be a veterinarian, honestly. I just kind of fell up on a scholarship and ended up enjoying uh, animal science and uh, was like, oh, well, I guess I'll apply to veterinary school. I got accepted, <laughs> thought I was going to be an equine practitioner working with athletes and um, ended up in small animal practice. They say bloom where you plant it. And um, I've been trying to bloom, sometimes difficult <laughs> because I do practice in the um, in the deep South, um, Southeast Louisiana in a very um, rural community. Um, even though it's a university town, it's um, still rural. Um, nothing compared to Knoxville where uh, <laughs> Dr. Blackwell is for college town. Um, and so, yes, I've had my share of experiences um, some similar to what Kara um, described, and I'm sure everyone will describe as we go on with the podcast, but thank you so much for having me. Um, I look forward to having this conversation. I feel honored to be able to be here to speak um, on behalf of the NABV and um, veterinarians of color on this topic that has plagued us forever, right? Our whole careers and now our whole lives as a black person. And now it seems like there's been an awakening. So I'm, I'm very honored to be able to um, speak on uh, this topic so necessary for our profession. Thank you. Michael. Thank you well, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And I certainly uh, appreciate this panel of, uh, of colleagues. I'm um, a Tuskegee graduate, but I started in life in veterinary medicine. My dad was um, a graduate of the second class of Tuskegee's veterinary school. He set up practice in Southeast Oklahoma, the only veterinarian for miles and miles and miles around. So <clears throat> he had a thriving practice, uh, mostly white clientele who gave him great respect. We lived very middle class, but um, it was uh, as I, I guess I was a, a grown child, maybe if I can put it that way, 
When I started to become aware of, uh, of the racial issues, um, for example, not being able to go to public uh, restaurants or certain businesses in our hometown. And uh, my dad was on the, um, he was appointed by the governor of the state of Oklahoma to be on the civil rights commission for the state. And that led to me being asked by him to integrate our high school was one of four students to do that. The only one from my uh, school, which was the primary black school in that region, the other three were from a little country school. And um, that began my career of, it just seems so many times, the first one ha having to deal with something. Um, mm -hmm. I finally appreciated that God just intended that I was <laughs> gonna be the first one through the door. I think uh, that culminated in 2000 when I became the first black dean of a veterinary college outside of Tennessee. Um, we are such a conservative profession and um, I am so hopeful and guardedly optimistic that the current events stimulating the many dialogues that you refer to are are going to lead to some changes, uh, very needed changes. So I appreciate being here. I appreciate being part of this conversation. And um, like yourself, I'm daily, it seems now, uh, in a conversation with somebody quite who wants to talk about it. And I welcome that because uh, if there's one thing that's gonna help, it's it's dialogue. And um, And so thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Sierra. Hi, everyone. What an honor it is to be here. Um, I have, of course, encountered all of you guys at some point, and so I'm just so honored to be in this discussion with you all. But I am recently Dr. Tiara Price, and <laughs> I am the founder of Black DVM Network. Uh, I will be taking a job in Los Angeles as a community medicine veterinarian. My experiences in vet school led me to found um, Black DVM Network because I noticed that I was one of very few Black people in my class. And I wasn't sure if that was the same way for other schools, for other students. So I started an Instagram page to send a signal out and see where the other students were, what schools they were at, what they were doing, and that quickly revealed to me a gap in resources for the Black veterinary community. And um, I decided to create a website and start an organization. So that's where Black DVM Network has come from. I have, have had really good experiences in veterinary medicine, but have noticed the lack of diversity and the constant education that is needed for my fellow colleagues. I think that the current times that we're in is we are we are on a great journey, but it is a long journey and it's it's not gonna happen overnight. And that's been that's been my my message to anyone that I've talked to is that we we just have so so much further to go. So thank you for having me, Dr. Greenhill. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> um, again, I know that uh, most of you have not been giving uh, interviews or not really kind of um, accepting uh, opportunities to, to kind of talk publicly. So I'm really glad um, that you all uh, are allowing me to, to have you on the show. So thank you to each of you. So my first question is really kind of, how's everybody doing? <laughs> it's just kind of just a well-being check-in, right? Because I think that, um, these have been, um, I, I think that, that many of us have, have been to, in some version of this before. Um, this is not new, um, but there does, at least for me in my own personal experience, um, it feels a little different, um, yeah, a little different. Um, so so how's, everybody, how's everybody doing? Tyra, why don't we go with you down there in Louisiana? Um. <laughs> Um, I'm okay. Initially, um, I just, I think I have a 17 year old son and, um, you know, uh, yeah. So, um, 
probably the the end of May and the first part of June. He made 17 last week. Um, you know, the Ahmad Aubrey, once that tape came out, it was just like, oh my gosh, you know, and then the Brianna Taylor thing, I think came out right after that. And then here comes George, George Floyd. And I just think about my son who's getting ready to drive. And what if he got pulled over and he is a big black boy that looks way older than he is. And, you know, he speaks very low and, you know, he, you know, he's, he's not like, he's very mannerable, but, you know, he'll speak low or mumbled and you know and what if they stop him and they think he's not complying because he's not speaking fast enough for them or whatever you know so I didn't sleep um for probably two weeks well at all like I had to like I never watched the news anyway because um um I just don't like uh <laughs> my ex-husband would watch the news all the time and it was just it, it became exhausting and so like, I took a break from the news. I get alerts because I need to know what's going on. Like if it's a traffic jam or there's something going on. But um, after social media, seeing all these things, I was like, maybe I need to watch the news and like, just get a broader perspective of what's going on outside of social media newscasters, right? And it was the worst decision I could have ever made. I was just like glued to the TV, watching the footage. I couldn't sleep. Um, I was having to take medication to sleep because I just kept thinking about how angry it made me and about my son, like just being afraid for my son, like, oh my gosh, like what, you know, the burden of a black mother and just talking about it has me a little emotional because we have such a burden, like today in 2020 as a black mother, like having the conversation with my son about Tamir Rice and like seeing him cry when I told him that a kid his age was murdered for playing in the park, like, like he was a baby. Like, why would I, ha like, why should I have to have that type of conversation with him at like 11, you know, or in fourth grade, you know, telling him, well, you know, you're the only black in your Catholic school classroom and, you know, just make sure you listen. And if you say something, you're going to be noticed before everybody else because you're bigger and you're black. So, you know, just thinking about his innocence being lost that young. And then now here we are all these years later, Baton Rouge has had its share of social unrest um, since the summer of 2016. And so it's just like, it's just, it's just heavy um, as a black mother. So yeah, I didn't, I didn't sleep well for a while. I'm better. But um, the initial, whew, it was much. It was much. Yeah. 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 And that's yeah. not even the workplace because nobody's talking about it. We're on curbside <laughs> for COVID. So I'm not having any conversations with anybody at work. So <laughs> And my employees have said nothing. <laughs> get one of these curbside jobs then because <laughs> my inbox is full. Um, so, oh, Karen, no, no, not that I'm, no, no, not that I'm not getting inboxes from yeah. like professional inboxes and, you know, things like that. But no, no one at work um, has discussed it. And I prefer it that way. Uh, it's been enough. Kara, what about you? How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing better now. Um, Similar to Tyra, when I first heard about um, George Floyd, I like, it's kind of like in trauma mode. So I just kind of shut down and I couldn't watch it for a while. Like I, a long time ago, I stopped watching all the videos cause it's just too traumatizing to see them. Um, but eventually I did watch the video and it's terrifying. Like. I'm terrified for my family, for my dad, my uncles, my husband. Um, I've been like, we live in a pretty nice suburb neighborhood in New Jersey, um, right, like very close to Patterson, um, which is a big city in New Jersey outside of New York City. Um, it has a lot of crime and a, a mostly uh, minority and black population. Um, so we have like police patrolling our neighborhood and everybody in these houses around us is like white and have their, you know, like Trump flags. Um, and he loves to go jogging and the, the gyms are closed. So he's outside. So now I'm trying to like jog with him. <laughs> Thinking maybe that'll help. But um, yeah, so that has been st stressful. And then on top of it, I manage... Um, the social media for the Multicultural Veterinary Medical Association. So now I'm kind of like 
forced to be constantly watching the news and the social media posts. And um, we've had like a huge influx of new allies or people who want to be allies um, that like that first week, they just sort of took over our whole Facebook page. <laughs> Uh, so just figuring out how to manage all that, um, like literally my phone was going off like every, I don't know, two minutes. Um, so that was hard. I didn't sleep for a long time, um, about two <coughs> weeks probably. Now I can sleep better. Um, things have kind of calmed down a little bit. And then I'm, uh, I have a multicultural mixed race family. So that has been crazy because some of the white people are like full-blown allies. Some people are beginning their journey and some are staunchly all lives matter. Um, and saying it's like racist to say black lives matter. So there's been like family feuds on social media <laughs> and phone calls and it's just a lot. So. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, thank you for asking. Michael, how you doing? Well, I, uh, <clears throat> I'm maintaining. Um, there's nothing new under the sun. Some wise man called Sol Solomon uh, told us, and that certainly is true here. Um, as most black men have to experience as kids, uh, hearing the conversation about the do's and don'ts and um, what to do in a given situation, because um, this country has, uh, especially throughout the South, has has uh, had these kinds of issues going on with with the police departments across the country. When I was a kid, it was um, it's reported that probably around 50% of the sheriff's offices or sheriff's deputies in, in, uh, in the South were actually Klansmen. And, um, and so back in that day, a lot of people didn't get on airplanes and fly. We would drive to wherever if you did travel. And you know, back in the day, you always packed all the food you needed because <clears throat> there was no stopping at a restaurant to get something to eat. You didn't stop to you to use the restroom, that was some roadside thing that had to happen. Um, and you avoided many small towns because of, um, of the likelihood of being just stopped for any reason. Well, I can tell you over my career as a, as a black man driving, and so I'm, I'm hearing all these, um, these responses. Um, yes, Tyra, something to be concerned about. <clears throat> yes, Kara with your husband. Um, I've been stopped many times. It's, um, it's not an unusual occurrence, but it's a stressful one because you never know what's, what you're gonna encounter on the other side. And, you know, I think the most horrible experience was actually being detained um, for several hours for a made up problem until money got wired into this this police department. This was out in Oklahoma. So when I see um, the uh, excessive force and actual criminal activity by the police, it's not new. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate that that's still where we are. I'm optimistic more than I have been in a few years because there are more white people who are seemingly waking up. When I see the many white faces among the protesters, it tells me that the country has moved to a different place because of mainly the millennial generation, mm -hmm. a new crop of Americans. I am both torn, disappointed, uh, pained, but at the same time, can find optimism in where we are at this point. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so just to echo what almost everyone else has said, the first two weeks were a challenge. 
little to no sleep, um, flooded with inboxes and social media was, was crazy. But the events, the, the trifecta that we saw that brought, brought all of the events, um, that was, these were not my um, awakening events like they are for most people, right? Um, and so I, I had better coping mechanisms this time around. And I did start to feel a little more optimistic, like Dr. Blackwell said, when I saw the movement that was happening because Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, those, those were my men. <laughs> those were the men that I cried about, that I stayed up all night for. Um, I was in college when, when the no indictment came on the officer for Michael Brown and it was Thanksgiving week and I did not sleep. I was so upset. I had no coping mechanisms. Um, and that's when I dived in. I said, I'm, I'm supporting black people all the way. I don't care what it is. I don't care what it takes. And so I felt so much better equipped in the last month to deal with the situations that have, that have come about because I started that journey four or five years ago what can I do for my people? Where do I stand? Where do I fit in? Um, I have to be bold about it. I have to be loud and proud. One of the hashtags that I use for Black DVM Network all the time is Black Out Loud, and I love it. It's my favorite hashtag. So it's my favorite, it's my favorite motto to live by. <laughs> um, and, and I understand that, that Black men don't, don't have that privilege, right? They can't, they can't always be Black Out Loud because that, that, that doesn't always work, but you know, I felt better equipped for these events. And I, my heart goes out to the people that it's hitting really hard, and that you know haven't have not um, have not have not slept, and you know have been up. But but I knew I can't watch the news, and I'm not watching any black men get killed. I'm not watching videos of black men getting killed. That that is that's a boundary for me. And um, I saw, you know, people were sharing, there was a CNN documentary that showed, you know, all the killings in the last 10 or 15 years. And I said, never why, are we, why are we watching this? You guys are desensitizing people to the killing of black men. Anyone that can sit there and watch that and just over and over and over again, I'm not watching that. And so the, the biggest thing that I've learned from the last few weeks is that I have my lane and I'm staying in it right? Black DVM Network, we're here for Black veterinary professionals. We, we educate, we, we know what's going on. We, you know, try to keep ourselves educated. We're not here to educate anybody else, you know. Um, we don't have, you know, make, we're not participating in protests. Some people are, I'm not, but, you know, we're, we're staying in our lane. And so I think that navigating, you know, the last few weeks and just, just having, having those mechanisms to cope and knowing that the work we, we laid the, the groundwork, uh, the framework, you know, a couple years ago and, and, and we're still doing a good work. Um, that has really helped me get through because if I sit down and I think about it for too long, and then I remember, I remember my men, my Michael Brown, Eric Garner, uh, you know, Trayvon Martin, and then, and, and then it, it, it'll start to get to me. So I'm definitely, I'm definitely thankful for the place that I'm currently in, where my journey intersects with this time, um, and that I'm in a better place to hopefully be able to have more productive discussions. Thank you. Um, well, I will share. Uh, for me, this has been uh, been around for a few years, <laughs> um, and uh, I will say that I've seen things, um, been through things. The last few weeks for me have been probably the most challenging of my career, and that is just because of um, well, while there has certainly been um, an overwhelming sense of grief um, and worry. I am, I'm also a mom. Um, my daughter will be 19 in a week and a half. And, um, and when she leaves the house, I hope she comes home. 
And even though we talk a lot about how we um, have the talk with our boys, we don't often talk about how much we need to have the talk with our girls and, um, and how challenging that talk is to have with our, our children of any gender. And, um, and so between that, kind of just that personal piece, but then kind of still working, right? Um, and really trying to meet the needs of the community um, and my member institutions um, has been uh, challenging because you kind of look around and there's so much need. Um, there's so much education that needs to be done. And I kind of sometimes feel like, well, what have I been doing the last 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I share um, some of that optimism because this does feel different. Um, the protests look different. Um, I mean, you know, typically they look different. The protests are global, um, which is exciting and encouraging, but also um, uh, saddening because this is not a phenomenon that's unique to the US. Mm -hmm. And many of these folks are protesting because they see these things happening in their countries as well. Um, certainly they're doing it in support of black Americans, but, but these things are, you know, we live in a, we live in a world now that is very globalized and, and everything, you know, that's the, everything is just a flight away. And, um, and so it's been both encouraging, but also kind of saddening to hear these experiences are shared across borders. Um, so that's been, uh, a, a bit challenging um, to deal with as well. But I am optimistic. Um, there is a, there does seem to be a, a thirst um, specifically within the profession. Um, and um, that's, that's a good thing. There's lots of, there's, you know, folks need to understand too that there's lots of resources out there. Um, I have been very, very public in um, reminding people that Google is free. <laughs> like, <laughs> Google is free and with the algorithms, if you search for things on anti-racism right now, the best stuff will come up, right? And so you won't get a lot of garbage. I guarantee you like that, that, that if you Google, um, there will be good stuff that comes up. So, um, you know, but I am encouraged. I am encouraged. And I have been um, pleased to hear and certainly want to hear from you all how, what kinds of support just professionally, um, you know, certainly there seems to be like I said, across veterinary organizations, statements are coming out. Sometimes multiple statements <laughs> come out, <laughs> you know, one statement and one evening, and then they kind of, you know, go back to the drawing board and maybe kind of revise some statements and come out with new ones. And, um, and there's a lot of learning happening, right? And, and, um, and so uh, what kinds of support have you seen just kind of across, uh, you know, veterinary medicine. Uh, Tiara, why don't we start with you since uh, you had to wait last, last time. <laughs> um, so across veterinary medicine, Black DVM Network was starting to receive some support early in March. And so that was, that was encouraging uh, vet med interconnected that brings together a host of, of organizations. Um, the Pride, BMC, uh, there, there have been a lot of a lot of veterinary organizations and now um, um, pet industry organizations. I'm not sure if that's happened with you guys that have that have reached out. And I, I love to see that support. I'm glad to know that people in veterinary medicine are talking about it. For me, veterinary medicine has always been about 30 to 40 years behind the times for anything. Absolutely anything. So I was. Uh, Medicine is good. <laughs> yes, medicine, medicine for sure. We're up there. <laughs> um, but but I, I was happy to see that veterinary medicine did did move with this movement that is occurring out you know outside of um, the realm of vet med. And I I have loved the support that I've seen from colleagues. Now, the idea of support is nice, and the theory is nice. The overwhelming um interaction that comes with that support is is exhausting during a time like this especially when you have a handful of organizations that have a mission to support diversity in vet med and so i think that 
you know, that support again has just been exhausting, but I, I've seen a lot of support from, you know, what can we do for your organization? Is there anything that we can learn from you all? Can we be a part of your organization? Things like that. Anybody else want to chime in on what kind of uh, things you're seeing in terms of support for um, Black veterinarians and kind of that, again, that Black Lives Matter in vet med? Um, I, I've checked a few. Um, I, I've just tried to, and I know this is probably like sad, but like I mentioned earlier, like I tell people all the time, like, <laughs> it's probably really bad. I'm a veterinarian. That's, that's what I do, but it's not who I am. And so even though I'm connected, I'm really disconnected. And I think that's how I've coped with being black in veterinary medicine for so long. Just like, okay, this is my job. This is what I do. This isn't who I am. This is what I do. Um, and so like, just personally, like I told, I mentioned, like, I don't have a lot of friends who are veterinarian other than my classmates. We talk all the time. You know, it's like, we have our own chats and stuff like that. We did a couple of check-ins, but we talk all the time. And so it's not like, you know, I've seen all this stuff online because to be honest, most of my non-Black veterinary friends are my classmates or people that went to school with me. So they're not, so they understand if they went to Tuskegee, they, that's the, they, you know, just the, it just is diverse as you're going to get. Right. And so, you know, I've had classmates, I posted something that, but you know, their position already because they don't just post now, like my classmates, who went there, they've always posted things that were um, diversity driven or, and things like that. So now it's not any different. Like I had a classmate was like, you know, Tyra, like this is horrible that this keep, this keep going on. You know, you know, we need to do more, you know, like we need to do more. And I was like, just saying that is enough. But she's, this one particular classmate has always been that person. And a few others have always been that person. So, um, my class, like I said, my classmates, for the most part, we're very close. So, I mean, it wasn't, you know, my experience is different, I'm sure, than Kara and Tierra's. Um, so that type of support, I haven't really seen much. My, um, my, even my former boss's family, like she reposted a post I made about my son on Facebook, but that wasn't something that I would have expected from them, right? Um, his son's business posted about Black Lives Matter. They own a business in New Orleans about, you know, they're not going to tolerate, but that's the family. They, they hired me when other people would not, you know, so that it's different. So, um, you know, it's no, it's no different from my veterinary close knit community um, as far as support goes. Now in the NABV um, inbox, um, I had a lady uh, we've gotten donations and um, we've gotten people wanting to reach out. They want us to take over their Facebook page and participate in all these things. And that's all well and good. And it's great. But um, like Tiara said, like, yeah, the, the, like the sheet's been removed and people can see this now, but okay, now it's a buzz. It's the hot thing, right? Diversity has been the hot thing for the last few years, but what have we done for diversity in all these years? Now it's like, you know, oh my gosh, maybe we're not doing enough. And so one lady was like, what can I do? I said, well, you emailed us. So that's the first step, <laughs> you know, like you've acknowledged it. So, you know, that's the first step. So yeah, we've got emails about support and donations and things like that. Um, so, but yeah, but that's about it. Like I said, I've kind of mm -hmm. separated myself. Like I don't follow a lot of groups and things like that. Um, I keep my social media is kind of for me as much as I can. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, Kara mentioned earlier that uh, MCVMA uh, experienced a flood, <laughs> <laughs> lots of allies, which is great. Yeah, yeah, to say the least. So um, my experience so far, basically all of my support within the veterinary world has come from the Multicultural Veterinary Medical Association. Like I cannot thank my board members enough. We have like a nine member board. Um, there's nine of us from all different races, ethnicities, backgrounds, and they have stepped up and done so much. And um, we put on this um, safe space dialogue, Zoom um, phone calls for, for uh, people of color in our association um, the first week of June. And I didn't even realize how much I needed it. <laughs> like being on this Zoom call with other people, um, vet techs and um, vet veterinarians, we're all like isolated, you know, we're 
most of us are um, working in a practice where everyone else is white. Um, most of the practices uh, aren't saying anything at all, or if they say something, it's like the worst thing you could possibly say. <laughs> so um, being able to talk with each other and validate that, um, that's been crucial. Uh, and then the influx of like, there are a lot of people joining in our profession, like you said, who have been reaching out to MCBMA or wanting to join, asking us what they can do, um, asking us if we can review their statements. Um, you know, like, wow. <laughs> uh, you know, and, uh, people wanting to be corporations wanting to be sponsors and things like that. Um, associations wanting us to give them diversity training. So it is actually part of our mission um, to increase cultural competency within the profession. Uh, but what we've decided as a board, um, at least for the time being, is to really triage and focus on um, the part of our mission that is creating a network for support for um, the BIPOC community um, within the veterinary profession. And so th that's why we, we started with those, um, those safe space dialogues. Um, and we haven't, like we've provided some resources for people to educate themselves um, but we're not really developing those resources <laughs> right now. Uh, and we haven't really taken too many phone calls and, and um, yeah, so I think we're kind of waiting for the fad wave to go down and then see who's actually sticking through it. Yeah, to continue um, helping people be allies because that's what we need in this profession. Yeah. We need things to change. Yeah. So. Why do you want to weigh in? Well, I, I would just, um, first of all, I appreciate the comments I've been hearing. And uh, for you millennials, um, you guys have a leadership role here. Uh, your generation is different. Um, the smartest generation of Americans ever because internet and so like you said google is free but uh, you guys have all kinds of reasons why you you have better access to information mm -hmm. and you you were shaped by social media mm -hmm. which included race mixing and all the rest it just was not a thing and so your reality as i understand it is so different from every previous generation. So while us older folks have our stories and we learn some things along the way and we definitely have some things to offer, um, we, we, we need you, we need to take, let you take the lead and be there to support what you're trying to do. Um, I believe this is my personal sentiment and um, I've held it dearly. My way of coping with something like this is to be doing something. Uh, I'm not one to hit the streets protesting. Uh, although one in my younger years, I, I had a little taste of that. I can never forget when a bunch of us were going to go downtown Tuskegee and tear down the rebel statue. And, and we tried, <laughs> but that thing was... <laughs> <laughs> that thing was bolted down. <laughs> yeah, in the square in downtown? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were going to take it down, but that didn't work. Um, wow. The millennials have figured out how to do it. They can do it today. <laughs> <laughs> well, the millennials know how to do that. Yeah. But, um, you know, I it reminds me of a, a welcomed conversation that I had <clears throat> um, last week. And it's from um, an organization that supports our work um, and their leadership team. And they, and I know that them well enough that, that, to believe that they are sincerely taking this moment as that wake up call for those involved in 
animal welfare work. This is not a veterinary organization, but animal welfare organization. Mm -hmm. And what was such an interesting discussion was, I say, Michael, we, we're coming to you with, with the why question. Now, some people may get, get upset by that. Like, what do you mean why? Well, look at, no, 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 no. This is when we don't shut down communication. Mm -hmm. This is when we, at least I don't, I, I want to embrace that moment. And, mm -hmm. and we had a great conversation about it. Now, frankly, it did center on, I came at it from the perspective of my work, which is a social justice work. Mm -hmm. And that is improving access to veterinary care for underserved families. Mm -hmm. Uh, many of whom are minority families because it's a socioeconomic issue. Tyra, we didn't ever forget about you and Baton Rouge, but other priorities have definitely oh, shaped. I know it. I um, know. We, 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 we have not forgotten you. Um, what I believe, where I was going with all of that is this. When there are these kinds of issues and odds, um, against us, I believe it's innately important to be doing something from your own sphere, from your own perspective. And like I say, maybe you don't hit the street protesting, but from that sphere of influence, you can do something. And um, because the alternative is basically powerlessness, you know, you're not doing anything and it's all bad stuff. So um, I won't go into more detail about any of it, but just say that it's not um, healthy to be on the fence or to sit back and think of it as someone else's responsibility. It's also important to recognize when new leadership shows up and that it's on time and how important it is now to work with that new leadership that's capable of doing some things in this moment, shaped by this moment, mm -hmm. as opposed to how I was shaped. Um, so guys, I'm proud of you for what you're doing and uh, these organizations that you have started or part of, or leaders, leaders in, and um, that's what we need. And we've never had it. Before you guys came along these organizations, we had the Tuskegee Veterinary Medicine Alumni Association because still 80% of black veterinarians are from Tuskegee. Um, we needed more people to come into this space. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy you're here. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. That means so much coming from you. Thank you. So what? Um, what kinds of, of things, do you, what kinds of programs do you want to see from other organizations? Or maybe the better question is, you know, really what does allyship in veterinary medicine look like? What, what do you want it to look like in this moment? I think personally, and I'll be brief, I think in this moment, um, allyship, um, allyship should be focused on a, recognizing that there is a problem, especially in our profession, being the whitest profession, right? The companies, institutions, um, you know, the organization that you work for, um, Lisa, understanding how important it is that if we're going to change anything, we have to change, we have to change the profession. The profession has to be more reflective of what you're trying to um, accomplish. So, Allyship in that regard is setting up programs and um, tools so that the profession can be more diverse, um, more a more holistic approach to admissions, um, cultural sensitivity training in um, a part of the curriculum and, uh, you know, a, a professionalism curriculum, um, communications curriculum is so important. Um, I just graduated from LSU. I got um, a graduate certificate in um, healthcare professions education. And I did my capstone about uh, communication, about the importance of um, effective communication in a communication skills um, education in veterinary programs. And so allies putting money in, you know, into the schools, giving them the tools to be able to provide this kind of training. Communication is key. That's the one thing, you know, um, being able to communicate and, and, and being 
aware of the differences and being culturally sensitive and aware and competent is so important. So I think allyship would start with that, working to make A, the profession more diverse and not just saying it, like really making steps to do that. Um, and starting with the education, you have to change the mindset of the veterinarians as you're molding them, um, you know, so that they are more culturally aware. I mean, a lot of veterinary students, I'm sure, may, some of them maybe never saw a Black person in real life. Let's just be honest, you know, like, that's, you know, a reality. And so um, I think uh, allyship, in my opinion, would be putting money towards true training and, and starting with the veterinary schools and admissions um, programs and scholarships to um, you know, make that possible. Since we wanna be so diverse, let's put our money there and really take real action. Um, I mean, action that you can chart and see and you know, from the beginning to the end, see that yes, this is the plan, this is what we're doing, this is where our money's going, and this is the outcome um, that we expect in a more diverse situation. So that's what I think. Um, that's just my two cents. <laughs> More than two cents. More than two cents. Other, other suggestions. What does allyship look like for you, Kara? Oh man, Lisa, I created a strong list for you. Oh, Actually, the, uh, the, I got, I got my homework here. So, um, oh, no cultural veterinary medical association. We have been, um, discussing what our demands are for the profession, <laughs> um, as well as uh, we, we recognize the power that the American Veteran Medical Association has as well in our uh, profession. They, um, they lobby Congress, they determine whether we can get a license or not. Uh, they control whether the schools are accredited. So uh, we wanna try to work with the AVMA um, to kind of try to influence it to, to change. Um, so some of these, these things we are working on ourselves um, and some of these things are things that we want the whole profession to do. So first of all, we want a recognition from like every single clinic, every single um, veterinary related uh, industry, corporation, business, just make a statement and recognize that there is a problem. Try to like make an honest, have a start an honest conversation about it um, and commit to addressing the problem in the industry. You know, don't just ignore it um, and, and don't make a, a, a statement that's surfacey, you know, um, be honest. Say you, you didn't know there was a problem before, you see it now, uh, you're learning, you have no idea. Uh, but you want to change and then show list what is your practice going to do to make a change. Um, we want there to be research in our profession, statistics um, about racial and ethnic diversity uh, in veterinary medicine. Like how many Black people, how many Hispanic people, how many um, Latinx, uh, Asian, you know, how many people are in each subset of our profession divided by race and ethnicity. I saw a lecture not too long ago um, of those stats divided by gender, but we didn't have any stats about race and ethnicity. How many are large animal? How many are specialists? How many are in industry or government? You know, we need those statistics. Um, and our, our association is working on trying to develop some research projects like that. So hopefully we can get some stats out there. Um, research in differences in salary and hours worked based on race and ethnicity. Um, just stats on the mental health status, suicide rates um, based on race and ethnicity within the veterinary profession. Um, we also are uh, think that there should be a system set up. We need a system set up for reporting and tracking incidents of discrimination in the profession for veterinarians, um, for staff and for clients. There's nowhere currently to report that. It's not being tracked. So that needs to be set up. Um, like Tyra said, requiring anti-racism training at the AVMA, um, in vet school, in workplaces, um, 
a lot of vet clinics get AHA certification um, or various certifications. So, you know, they should be required to have anti-racism training if they want to get certified. That's what I think. Um, and then increasing representation within the AVMA recruits specifically to veterinarians of color because we have been pushed out by the culture of the association. There are so many black veterinarians that aren't even a part of the AVMA at all because of the hostility that we faced within the association. Um, they, there is a new president elect coming up who is Puerto Rican, first time ever. So I'm hoping this is our moment this is an opportunity to change the culture from the top and from the bottom and all the way through. So um, those are some of the things that I wanna see from the profession. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, Kara, when did you graduate? 2013. Okay, Tiara, when did you graduate? 2020. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> we all are kind of like, you know, a little bit, uh, space in our um in our uh i guess graduation dates and uh the the climate of the country and experience um so i just wanted to know that just for my reference for future um responses just so i could have a gauge i figured you guys were behind me but i didn't know how like i knew tiara i was just doing that just because tiara but um, i knew tiara just graduated <laughs> but uh Kara, um, yeah. I was trying to see where you were. So yeah, you're about, you're 10 years after me, a whole decade. Okay. Much different. So, mm -hmm. okay. I was gonna say, you, you, didn't, you didn't ask my family who graduated. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> we know that. <laughs> see, <laughs> it's like, see it's okay. I'm gonna have to visit, I'm gonna have to visit Dr. Davis. Uh, we're no, gonna have to have no, a heart to heart. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. No, I, I well, I know that Dr. Blackwell graduated in a different generation. I was just trying to see like really where Kara fit in. Um and just you know, as a pleasure to ask Tiara. <laughs> yeah, I'm from a different era. Um may I may I uh, just Absolutely. comment on on analogship? I want to start where I left off. Now, the reason I am encouraged by the millennials is because many are discovering that what we are handing to you out of the 20th century doesn't work for you. It's ill-shaped, ill-prepared for the 21st century. We talk about climate. We can talk about a lot of things. We have handed you institutions as well that are malpositioned. Um, I think that most of those institutions are going to adjust and figure out um, how to be in the 21st century and you'll have a lot to do with that. But there are also some institutions that will be abandoned because um, of many reasons. Um, I'm not encouraging abandonment of the AVMA, but I do believe the AVMA is on the same path as the AMA, where most, most physicians are not members of the AMA. Um, but it is an association that's produced a few black presidents. Um, I was in a conversation with, I've used this a couple of times, you know, we look at the United States and we look at all these issues, and it's, this country is really messed up. And yet this country produced a black president for two terms. Yeah. So when I look at your organization and you've never had a more a minority leader. Now we do have the, the first in AVMA, but certainly not black. What does that say about how messed up you might be? Mm -hmm. uh, it really causes people to pause um, and, and, and process that. So allyship for me is going to be this. The, the reason why we have so few black veterinarians, veterinarians that are people of color is directly tied to systemic realities, tightly, tightly wound around socioeconomic realities educational opportunities, 
And, and as the cost of education has, has skyrocketed, it has just exacerbated mm -hmm. that problem so that now you've got a lot of privileged white women who go to veterinary college. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, there is no plan that I'm aware of in a pipeline that's going to fix that. So that's a structural and a systemic problem whose roots are way before veterinary medicine. Now, I said at the beginning of this um, conversation that <clears throat> we're a conservative profession. Well, let me explain, uh, expand on that just a little bit. Veterinarians are not known to get involved with social issues. The story is like this. Well, I don't wanna, I don't wanna upset any of my clients and you know, hurt, hurt my business. It's a legitimate concern. Yeah. You, know, you can't go around protesting and no. then expect, expect all your clients are going to no, be I happy get it. about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we have found ourselves um, like the dog on the haystack. <laughs> oh, you never heard about the dog on the haystack. So you shouldn't let old people come to these meetings. <laughs> <laughs> We're learning. We're learning right now. We're learning. <laughs> uh, so the dog is lying on the, lounging out on the haystack and and the cows are afraid to come over and eat the hay. So the dog can't eat the hay and won't let the cows eat the hay. Huh. Um, I guess there are these things that are in place that may not have been intended to have the consequences that they're having. But when we do those measures, Dr. Williams, yes, the, what you don't see, you don't, may not know. Mm -hmm. and, and as you can see things, uh, the more informed you are and, and the better decisions you can make. So allied ship, fixing this uh, racial representation, diversity in veterinary medicine has to start before. We've always known that. We used to talk about, well, you got to go to the elementary schools and you got to do, you know, these various things to expose young people. Well, that's important. But when you've not addressed the socioeconomic, this, you know, disparities and equities, you still have this structural fundamental problem. So, so the United States was founded by the one percenters. The constitution was written for the one percenters who were all white men, landowners. Mm -hmm. And what we are is a nation that is still trying to evolve from that very restricted mm -hmm. definition of who's empowered to have something in America. Mm -hmm. We're getting there. I just want, again, to say to you guys, as millennials, as young veterinarians, and Tyra, I'm gonna throw you in there now because you're very young relative to some of us. You guys don't have to accept that what was handed to you is in fact what you ought to live with mm -hmm. as an institution or as a system. Uh, some of it's got to be dismantled, dismantled in part in order to build a more uh, workable, uh, more effective uh, system. And uh, as far as the ABMA is concerned, I think it will slowly uh, evolve to a better place. It's been a good old boy system. Uh, the way you become president of ABMA is a good old boy process. And so, yeah, you get, you get what you see. But with more women now being in veterinary medicine and, and certainly um, more minorities, but then of the, the white women, many are millennials and a little bit more socially conscious, let's say, than, than previous, uh, th there's reason for optimism there. Uh, long answer, I, I, I just think allied ship is about the structural systemic problem that leads to the inability to get an education. Amen. Kira, anything to add? Well, <laughs> after um, after after everyone's comments, I mean, allyship, and this might seem really naive on my part, is very very simple for me. Um, it's it's empowering those around you and getting to know them on an individual level, like Dr. Blackwell said. I am not accepting the systems that are in place. And that's where Black EVM Network came from because 
I saw the things that were offered as far as diver diversity goes. I've had conversations with people and I said, this is not, this is not what I want. This is not what I think we need. And I think that, um, you know, everyone, I, I think that all of the approaches, um, the, the very planned out approaches and um, the, the plans and the initiatives are so important. And like you said, tracking and recording those. But at some point we have, I feel like we have to be black out loud and we have to say, these are black veterinarians. This is what they're doing. And we have to really make that transition seamless and allyship comes from people saying oh yeah i'm i'm friends with this person and i'm doing this with this person and i've gotten to know this person on an individual level um i've i've talked with them and i'm gonna now i as an ally feel empowered to go and tell my friends who may not actually ever make contact with someone because two percent that's you know it's kind of like a unicorn you should maybe uh you know be close to winning the lottery if you get to meet a black veterinarian you know, then, then they can go out and, and spread that. And, and then it just becomes, it becomes kind of a, a normal for you to accept the differences, the cultural differences and ethnicity. So um, allyship for me is, is, is us being proud of, of who we are. And, and I, I, I definitely understand and I see the discrimination that happens and the struggles that people have in, in vet school. And so, um, I think that we have a long, long way to go. And I'm excited to see uh, Dr. Williams, the initiatives and the demands that you have. I, I love those. I was like, yeah. those are, I was like, yeah, those are, those are great. And, um, you know, I, I, I can't wait for that. So, but yeah, like I said, for me, allyship is, is very simple. It's, it's recognizing um, the issue and recognizing us as people. And, and when people ask me about articles and interviews, and I say, I'm not going to talk to you about race and diversity, but I did that for Dr. Greenhill today. Um, I, <laughs> I, um, I said that, you know, we can talk about, we can talk about anything else. You can ask me about me as a person, and we can talk about my journey as a veterinarian um, without the qualifier that I, that I'm black. And so I, I tell them, you know, when you're trying to be more diverse in your in your posts and your articles, if you're looking for a dermatologist, don't just pick the first one you see. Like there are some black dermatologists also that you could feature as dermatologists, you know, and that can go in the dermatology section and not in the, oh, this this is a black veterinarian, let's put him in the diversity section. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I I like that seamless approach to allyship. Awesome. So I'm going to um, take the host's uh, prerogative, um, especially in my work at AAVMC. I believe that allyship is time, talent, and gifts. Um, and so folks got to do the work. Um, and um, part of that work is self-education. Certainly, I think that um, all of us have opportunities to have meaningful conversations. As Michael mentioned, sometimes those meaningful conversations are uncomfortable <laughs> sometimes they're challenging um but if you practice them they get better they get easier they get easier to have for us but they also get easier to have for, with allies um but you got to put in that work and and it's not easy you're talking about you know when folks ask me you know how do i learn this stuff and i'm like you're talking about you know 40 plus years <clears throat> nearly 50 years of lived experience like you are not gonna get that in a webinar like, that's not gonna happen. Like, those two things don't go together. Like, this is lived experience that I'm drawing on in addition to whatever educational blah, 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 you know, stuff that I have and other, you know, training and all of that. Um, so, you know, you gotta do the work. Um, and, um, you know, I, I posted something pretty provocative a couple of weeks ago and I was like, you know, many black and brown folks have been in this space and kind of dealing with, you know, underrepresentation and lack of diversity and all of that stuff for, again, our lives, our entire lived experience. And so I am delighted that people are, you know, awakening. We've been here a while, grab a coaster and don't put your feet on my table, like, but make yourself <laughs> out, right? Come on in. Um, but you got to do the work um, and you got to put in time with these organizations, um, these affinity groups, 
but you also, almost more importantly, you have to put in time in those legacy organizations because they do need to change. Um, and and um, allies are where that change is going to happen. Change is not gonna happen because of the 2%. That's not how change works. Change happens because of the majority demands. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so put in that time. Your talents, there are folks that really um, have amazing um, you know, talents at teaching and communicating and all of these things. Once you get that education, like use it and really um, you know, use those talents, um, bring in those other experiences and those other resources and really get in there and get dirty. I mean, this is, I tell people, I'm like, diversity work is not kittens and puppies. Like, I mean, and I tell, you know, I, I hear veterinarians all the time saying, yeah, okay, even small animal property, it's not kittens and puppies. Like diversity work is not, it's not cute. Like I put up pride flags, flags and, and, you know, and the fist and the whole bit, it is not, <laughs> it's, it can be kind of dirty work um, sometimes. So you gotta be willing to get in there with your talents and your time. And then finally gifts. Money talks. That's what I say. That's my thing. Right? Put your money where your mouth is. Put your money where your mouth is. Pay those memberships. Um, get involved. Get engaged. And um, there is a huge income inequity in this country and certainly globally. Um, and um, college affordability is very challenging for a lot of folks. And certainly once we talk about the graduate and professional level, it becomes out of reach for a lot of folks. Folks don't realize that, yeah, if you look at the aggregate pre-veterinary school, the median debt that folks are bringing in is zero. 63% of applicants this year had no debt. Um, but that's like nearly 40% that do have debt. And when you disaggregate that to look at applicants of color in particular and rural applicants, because those um, are mm -hmm. folks also disproportionately mm -hmm. Um, um, experience socioeconomic disadvantage, we see um, those applicants coming into veterinary school with $30,000, $35,000 of debt. And are statistically more likely to accumulate more debt than average um, um, in graduate school, in part because you know, families, they don't have family um, legacy kind of you know, resources to kind of help. Mm -hmm. Um, they're kind of going in um, completely financially alone without, you know, much of a safety net. And so, you know, I was um, looking at things, I mean, because, you know, we haven't even talked about all that is happening in the middle of a pandemic, right? And so- Okay, I told you COVID, I haven't had a conversation with anybody. <laughs> but, you know, when I looked at um, students um, and they're just dealing with some of the well-being issues related to the pandemic before all of this popped off, 18% um, said that they were, um, they didn't have um, reliable internet. Um, and like, you know, 28% uh, were really, really concerned about um, major financial distress. And when you think about when you break down kind of the living budget um, that the colleges say that you're supposed to live on for a year, most students are living at about 185% of, um, of the poverty line, which in most states makes you eligible for social services. They're broke, okay? <laughs> so, so they should apply. <laughs> no. Keep in mind, like, don't show this part. Don't show this part to applicants, right? But, but I mean, it does mean that you need to be donating to scholarships um, for, you know, um, for disadvantaged students, um, for underrepresented students. Um, this is one of the biggest call to actions from um, George Floyd's funeral in in Minnesota was that every institution should be having a scholarship fund. Um, for, you know, black and brown students. And so, you know, put your money where your mouth is. It's mm -hmm. you know, every little bit helps. I can tell you it is expensive to be poor. And so everybody knows every nickel, every dime counts, right? Every nickel, every dime counts, so do what you can. So, um, so time, talent, and gifts is um, really what I expect from allies, um, but you got to do the work. And again, there's no... I want you to take all of the webinars, and by the way, AVMA has made all of their DNI webinars free and available, whether you're an AVMA oh, okay. or not. Um, 
So, you know, go out there and, and do the thing, but uh, just know that those, those, you know, a dozen or so uh, webinars are this much. You still got a lot of other stuff to do. So, you know, do it, but do it. Books are on audio, Google is free, get it done. So, um, so with that, any parting words from my guests this evening? I just hope that um, this awakening and this, you know, just this uh, drive to, to make a difference really um, continues on. And it's just not a fad, like so many other things, right? Um, in veterinary medicine, you know, you get the new hot room drug. Oh, it's so great. Yay. You know, and then here we go, like two years later, three years later. Oh, no, we have it better. We remixed it. Um, you know, don't do that anymore. And so I'm hoping that this these situations and where the, where, the, where the country is right now and this wanting to change and all these things, hopefully we can use it um, as black and brown people to our advantage um, to move forward. But I hope that these people who want to be allies and you know, those who are saying that you know, black lives matter and black DVMs matter and DVMs of color matter and you know, transgender, gay, queer lives matter. Hopefully these people really mean that and in six months, you know, we're still getting money in. To, our scholarships are being created, and and um, uh, programs are being created that can really make sure that the work is done. Something that can be um, assessed and monitored, so that you know we could see a change in our profession. Um, that, that's my hope. I hope that, and I'm a pretty optimistic person. So even when in the back of my mind is like, well, you know what, Tara, this might not be so, but you know what? Yeah. Let's just, you know, say that, yeah, you know, try to give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, but that's my hope. Like in a year, we still have the same drive and we still see people wanting to donate and, and really see the action um, come from the words of those who seem to be so um, eager um, to, to see change and, uh, and do something. I hope in a year we can see the, um, the results of that. We can have something tangible that we can see that's been done uh, to make the changes. And not all of the things are gonna be there, but something that we can say, yeah, look, you know, we can see that it's moving forward. Things have been done. So that's my hope. So I'm gonna remain hopeful. So with permission from everyone else, I think it will end there because I think that that's, uh, you know, um, ending on uh, a note of hope that that things will continue to improve. Oh, but wait. Dr. Greenhill, yeah. I just want to, uh, especially if the folks in, in, uh, in this uh, interview are, are not aware, AAVMC has actually been the, mo the foremost organized veterinary medicine uh, unit, organization, entity, embracing diversity. Mm -hmm. It's been going on for a number of years and Dr. Greenhill is of course, primarily responsible for that. Now we've had black people with vet colleges and other places that have been in this space. But when we think of organized veterinary medicine from AVMA to the specialty associations and state associations, nobody has been in this space like AABMC. So we wanna thank you, Dr. Greenhill, for your leadership, your uh, consistent and persistent um, energy and focus upon uh, on these issues. You know you're making a difference and, uh, and we appreciate you. Thank you, it is my pleasure. Um, I am honored to get to hang around this profession. Um, you all are a fun bunch of people. 87% of the time. <laughs> <I'm kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, tell the truth now. <laughs> um, no, but you know, it hasn't always been easy, but I, um, for folks that don't know, this is my third tour of duty <laughs> with AAVMC and I wouldn't come back if I didn't. Um, love this profession, and um, it is truly my honor and privilege to be able to um, be a part of the profession and um, to do this work at AAVMC. I've had um, wonderful leadership at AAVMC over the years that have certainly supported my work, wonderful members, um, and uh, so thank you.
very much. So. So this has been another episode of Diversity and Inclusion on Air. To my guests, Kara, Tyra, Tierra, and Michael, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful yeah. conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I feel like it's it's been a very special after school special um, <laughs> uh, diversity and inclusion on air. Um, so be sure to like uh, the uh, like the podcast and uh, to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast podcast app. We're on Apple, we're on Stipper, Stitcher, we're on Amazon, we're on all of the things. Um, and be sure to like uh, the Facebook page, which is called AAVMC Diversity Inclusion on Air. So with that, I will say good evening to my my wonderful colleagues. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, guys. You guys keep up the good work. I'm proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>